backup recorder and the real recorder. Okay, we're ready. All right. So this is J.J. Pianchi at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign interviewing Brad Gold on July 10th, 2017 in the University Library. Where and when were you born? I was born in Lafayette, Indiana on February 9th, 1960. All right. Who are or were your parents and what are or were their occupations? Uh, my dad is Tom Gould and he was a high school teacher and a basketball coach and a golf coach. My mom is Peggy Lambert now, and she lives in Monticello, Indiana, and basically she worked for the school off and on part-time. Okay. Do you have any siblings? I have a brother, Mark. He uh, is a, well, he's about a bunch of everything. He <laughs> takes care of lawns, and he uh, coaches basketball, and he lives out in Spearfish, South Dakota, out by Sturgis, so. Okay. Um, did they serve in the military as well? No. No. Okay. What were you doing before you entered the service? I went to Purdue, had some real good times, and they asked me not to come back until I got my grades up somewhere else. I went from a 3.2 first semester to a 0, 0.0 second semester. Real good time. Oh, yeah, I, I can see that. <laughs> and uh, so I came from with my dad being a coach and a teacher, and I finished 19th in my class. I decided I needed to do something, and the military was the choice. Probably the best choice I ever made in my life. Okay. So, What branch did you serve in? United States Air Force. Nice. Uh, and did you enlist or undrafted? I was, I was enlisted. Why did you choose that branch of the service? Two things. One, he was the only recruiter there that day that would talk to me. And two, I had always looked at the Air Force, you know, and because the jobs, opportunities, once you got out of the military, were greater when if you stayed in the military. Mm -hmm. So... So did you feel that the training in the Air Force was, was better? No, it's just the, the jobs that the military had related to the, related to the civilian world. It, it was easier to go from the Air Force to the civilian world than it was like the Army that I was an infantryman. Mm -hmm. There's not much call, except being a policeman, there's not much call for that, you know. Okay. So that was one. That was probably the biggest decision. So you were already looking at when I get out, what are the skills I need right. to I go actually, into I actually job. went in to finish my college. Okay. And 26 years later, from my first class at Purdue, I did finish my college. Congratulations! But it took 26 years. Well, there you go. So what happened when you departed for training camp and during your early days of training? What was that like? Well, I was 21 when I went there. And I was still scared to death. Uh, they were going to yell at you whether you did something right or wrong. They, just, they were going to yell at you once a day, no matter what. And uh, once I got through basic training and got into the technical part of, of learning in my job, it, it became a lot easier. Uh, mm -hmm. Like I said, I, liked, I actually liked school. I was one of those sick kids that liked high school. And uh, it became easy. The academic mm -hmm. environment came real easy. And the Air Force be <coughs> became a lot easier once you get out of that. Because they're going to tear you down build you up. Mm -hmm. And once you, you're done with that, it, it, was, it was not always easy. There's some long hours, but from day to day, it was, all, it was easy. Mm -hmm. what, did you, what was your job then? What did you I was in medical them? logistics. We ordered everything from pins to x-ray machines to all the medicine for the hospital mm -hmm. and we were the ones that took care of all the uh, like mass I, mm -hmm. I was in charge when I got out of probably three mobile hospitals that were ready to go at any given time okay nice do you recall your instructors and if so what were they like I do actually uh, they uh, I reason the reason I do so well is that I, uh, my first base was the same base my training was at, so mm -hmm. I just went from one side of the the 
air base to the other side. Um, they were they were hard, but they were fair, and they one thing they stuck out is they laughed, and laughter is good. Laughter is good. I mean, you know, so even in the most stringent meeting, uh, there should be laughter. You know. Any anyone in particular that you remember fondly or? Uh, yeah, there was a uh, Chief Master Sergeant Roland Harvey. He, uh, I met him when I uh, first got to Scott Air Force Base. Uh, he ended up being the highest ranking in my career field. Um, he uh, he he took me underneath his wing, and then there's another one, uh, Senior Master Sergeant Randy Rogers. He was my first supervisor when I got become active duty and then we worked together later on when we both had more stripes and Chief Harvey's now out in Colorado somewhere retired. Uh, Sergeant Rogers and I stay in contact on a daily basis, on a you know, weekly basis I would say. So, Cool. Um, so did you receive any specialized training and if so in what? Well, all the specialized training I received in is uh, was for medical logistics. Uh, it was an eight eight week class, and uh, then you're upgraded every. Oh, sorry. No worries. Let me turn this off. But you're upgraded. Um, you're upgraded at different levels. You go to different classes. Mm -hmm. And then I was also, for a four-year stint, I was on search and recovery. And mm -hmm. you're trained to do that. Mm -hmm. And that's that's good and bad. You know. okay. What were the good parts? What were the bad parts? Good parts was the, the camaraderie. Mm -hmm. I, the gentleman I just mentioned, Chief Harvey, uh, when he got in charge of the career field, uh, he sent me to Korea with 19 years in the military. Please, needless to say, I wasn't too happy, but it was Chief Harvey. And I went over there for Y2K in 1999 to make sure, because uh, Korea was the first Air Force base that went to 2000. Right. And when the, we were over there, so I spent my nose in a computer <laughs> when 2000 rolled around <laughs> instead of partying with everybody else. <laughs> but... Um, I went there kicking and screaming, but in hindsight, it was the best year of my military career because there was less, there weren't malls around the military base, uh, things to do. You stuck around the camaraderie, mm -hmm. and the camaraderie in the, in the military uh, is still strong. Even as a veteran, BFW, American Legion, mm -hmm. you know, you can pick on a Marine or you can pick on the Army. But if anybody outside picks on the Marines or Army, you stand up for them, you know. Yeah, yeah. And it's still there today. And sure. So. Good. How did you adapt to military life, including the physical regimen, barracks, food, and social life? Uh, the physical part, I was young then. Uh, don't know if I could do it today. <laughs> uh, the barracks... Unless you've lived in a place where you all shower in the same area, you, the bunks are two feet apart, and uh, that's not so good. That, <laughs> that life wasn't good. Uh, but once you got out of all that, uh, my first place to stay was no different than the dormitories here at U of I. Uh, two person to a room. Um, and you shared a bathroom with the next room over. wasn't It wasn't so bad. You just hope you didn't all have the same shift, you know, at the time thing. The food, that's eh, not too bad. I <laughs> uh, hope you like. We called it SOS. Uh, basically, it's chipped beef over on bread. <laughs> basically, a poor man's version of biscuits and gravy. But all in all, you know, the even the MREs that come in the bag aren't that bad it was just a little salty but that that life you know you were eating you were sometimes you were happy to eat so it didn't, it didn't really matter <laughs> how about social life social life uh except the year i spent in korea that social life was a lot differently but 
social life in the military, uh, when, there was, when there wasn't anything going on, it was normal. You came home, you kissed your kids and let them play. I mean, social life for kids were a lot easier because you were inside a fenced-in area and kids could do a lot more on a military base than they can out and around here. Um, now, social life for spouses when you're deployed and gone, uh, that's, that's different. That's very, very different. Um, and coming back from a deployment it is probably one of the hardest things because your spouse has gained independence and mm -hmm. your kids live a year without dad. And so yeah. that's kind of hard. That's one of the hardest things is to fit back in once you've been gone. Sure. Our everyday social life was, you know, bought cookouts just like, every, you know, like everybody else has. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, where were you stationed? You were asking earlier about I was, what to put down. I first started out at Lackland Air Force Base for basic training in San Antonio. Mm -hmm. I was lucky that I went there in April and May, and it wasn't June, July, and August in San Antonio. Then I uh, went up to Wichita Falls Shepherd Air Force Base, and that's where my tech school was, uh, technical training. And then I got l lucky or not lucky, it depends on how you s see it, is... Uh, I stayed there for three years. Wichita Falls is two hours from Oklahoma City and an hour and a half from Fort Worth, basically in the middle of tumbleweeds. It, mm -hmm. it was all right. It wasn't great. Then uh, after I finished that stint, I went to Grissom Air Force Base in Indiana, which is now closed. Mm -hmm. That was a good thing because my mom was... 70 miles away. My dad was 80 miles away. It wasn't too bad. Um, my wife at the time got out of the military, so I was no longer married to the military, and as soon as she got out, I got shipped over to the Netherlands, um, Schuster, Schusterberg Air Force Base, or Air Base. Spent two years over there. Uh, was brought to Scott Air Force Base down in Belleville, Illinois, and uh, then um, went to Korea for a year, came back a couple of years back to Scott. My family got to stay there, and then I retired. And then while I was at the Netherlands, I, I did deploy for Desert Storm out of the Netherlands. So, mm -hmm. so did you do a full 20 years? I did. Well, I tell everybody 22. It's actually 21, 7 months, and 6 days. So. Do you know that in hours and seconds as well? No. <laughs> okay. So, what were some of your memories of being abroad? Being abroad? And... Um, first time abroad in the Netherlands, uh, they wore different clothes. <laughs> uh, they wore some shoes that I would probably never... They were probably six to nine months ahead of what we see in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, the younger uh, people in the, uh, the Dutch know English mm -hmm. uh, because of they basically were trampled in World War II and English is taught to everybody over there. Uh, I'm very adventurous. I will try food no matter where I go. Um, but you got to see everything. You just you you need to learn and respect their culture is one of the first things that that would be your biggest problem getting in there. Mm -hmm. Now there are some places in Germany where the dollar wasn't they didn't need the dollar. Mm -hmm. They spoke very little English and asking for directions was a flip of a coin whether they were telling you the right thing or not. Mm -hmm. Um then my second time overseas was um was to Korea. The Korean people are fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, they know the mil our military is there. They're very friendly. Uh, they, you just like I said, you gotta know their customs. I had a Korean working for me, and I wrote a note real quick saying, "Mr. Han, you need to order this downtown," and I wrote it in red ink. And he came to me and asked me why I wanted him to die. <laughs> and uh, so you learn. 
You learn from experience, uh, you know, driving in any foreign country is an adventure. It's almost like driving in Chicago, <laughs> uh, except they drive on the other side of the road. And um, we have big, bigger vehicles, they got smaller roads, and <laughs> it can be fun. Uh, but I got to see, I got to see the Hollands known for their tulips and their windmills. Uh, we went to, we drove, drove down to the Belgian border one day, Belgium and France. We drove like four hours, watched the Tour de France ride by within a matter of 15 minutes. Got up, backed up, drove <laughs> back. <coughs> got to see the Olympics, got to see Oktoberfest. Um, you know, uh, while we were in England, you know, the Queen's birthday is, place shuts down, it's just one big party. Mm -hmm. And, uh, we found out the Dutch, we served tacos out of our little booth in Mountain Dew, because they can't get Mountain Dew, so they, we made a killing off that. <laughs> and the Koreans, the Korean history is just, it's beautiful over there. It's chilly and rocky, but it's its beautiful. And the, but the monsoon season for 30 days, when the rain actually rains sideways, that's the bad part of Korea. <laughs> so. <laughs> You also said that you were deployed into, I think you said Desert Storm? Desert Storm. I got sent. Uh, I was outside what considered the combat area, but I helped uh, set up a 500-bed hospital. Luckily, Desert, Desert Storm didn't happen to where we, we used it, um, but it wasn't massive, you know. And what, what it was is... Uh, Everybody would funnel into that hospital, and mm -hmm. then they would be funneled to other hospitals in mm -hmm. Europe. There's a, a big Air Force base at Wiesbaden in Germany, and there's a lawn stool, which are probably 10 miles apart. Army runs one, Air Force runs the other. Mm -hmm. And then people, when they were stable, got shipped out of there. But I, uh, basically my job was, after it set up, was to make sure that all the supplies that needed to go down down range was there and ready so most of my time was spent talking back to the people in the United States at Fort mm -hmm. Detrick, Maryland making sure the supplies were ready, were ready. Mm -hmm. making sure no one borrowed them when the <laughs> plane landed elsewhere <laughs> right so were you in Kuwait or were you in Iraq or I was actually in, in Saudi Arabia, in Saudi Arabia. Yeah. And how was it like living there? Uh, um, don't know. Didn't leave the base much. Didn't leave the base. <laughs> I was only there six weeks. Okay. And then I moved back into Germany to the Wiesbaden Hospital and, um, and spent in another six weeks there. And then it, it was pretty much over. Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, these poor young kids that are deploying seven, eight six, seven, eight times now, you know, mm -hmm. my heart goes out to them, mm -hmm. so. So in, so you weren't on the front lines and your duties were really to do medical logistics and supply. Right. Um, okay. Uh, what kinds of friendships and camaraderie did you form while serving with, while serving and with whom? Um, the two guys I mentioned earlier are really good. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of the people I was talking to in Korea, some of the best ones now are the young, I still call them kids, I know they're not kids anymore, but they're still <laughs> older, they're just not much older than mine. Um, since the invention of Facebook, these young kids that are now the rank I was when I retired are still calling me or asking me questions that, you know, they're having the same problems I did with them, you know, 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I probably, out of the group that I had my last few years in, I probably stayed in contact with 14 to 15 out of the 20 of them. So, mm -hmm. and plus with the, uh, I'm very big into Veterans of Foreign Wars. Mm -hmm. uh, I am actually the junior vice commander for the state of Illinois right now. I was commander down here in the post in Urbana for four out of the last 
I guess nine years now, and uh, and also I'm a veteran service officer. My daytime job, so <laughs> I stay in contact with veterans as much as I possibly can. What was your muster out rank? I was E seven master sergeant. Okay, congratulations. Um, so how did you stay in touch with family and friends back home, especially when you were zipping around the country? Yeah, the world? back then. They didn't have uh, they didn't have Facebook, email. Hell, I think at the time my dad had that email where you had to dial up on your TV. I think MSN or my, my somebody had it. Mm -hmm. It take you an hour just to get on it. Uh, but the military is very good about uh, they have call days where you can call in. And you would, uh, and you had 15 minutes to call and talk to whoever you need to talk to, and you can, you can be very quick about mm -hmm. what you needed to say and stuff like that. Now, my father, when he would call me when I was in the Netherlands, because I had uh, my own apartment, mm -hmm. and uh, I lived in on the economy downtown, and but his problem is he could never get the time zone right. Uh, Whatever. Calling you at 2 a.m., was yeah, he? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, so you stayed in touch. Uh, my kids, I actually wrote letters to them. That's back when writing letters was still okay. <laughs> Postcards, because I think they were three and four when I went to the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. uh, Korea, they were older, and they would say hi, bye, and they were out the door. They, mm -hmm. Dad was not... Not cool. <clears throat> now, so, <laughs> so it was just... So it depends on the, really the age of the kids, you know, and stuff like sure. that. So send a lot of gifts back. Uh, you know, chocolates are very big in Europe. And chocolates are very good with kids. So, they, <laughs> so it wasn't too bad. Nice. What did you do for recreation when you were off duty? Uh, Military is very good about uh, playing a lot of racquetball. Uh, Every, I can't say every, but majority of the military bases, everyone in the United States probably has a golf course. <laughs> a lot of guys, even the base I was at in Korea had a golf course. Uh, played softball up until about 35 when my knees couldn't take it any longer. A lot of softball. Actually, Germany has a, a softball tournament every year of all medical mm -hmm. hospitals in in, in Europe and everybody comes together for three or four days um, a lot of bowling bowling is big on the military base um, and that, you know that's pretty. and then we participate in Netherlands we did a lot of biking mm -hmm. they have bike trails like there would be the road the sidewalk and then the bike trail mm -hmm. and you can go off into the woods and there's it's just like driving. It's there's directional signs. There's, I mean, they had stoplights for the bikes along with it, and but I'd say probably sixty percent of the of the Dutch people biked, mm -hmm. and we would take off and go to the near, a nearest city, and they're big on what you see uh, downtown here. There's cafes. You sit outside, and you eat, and then we ride, you know, ride back, and, and so. I was only 30 then, that was, that was all right. That was different. <laughs> yeah. When you were in the service, did you read for pleasure, and if so, what? No, I can't say I did. About the only thing I read was stuff for promotion. Uh, and uh, a lot of the information that I would got would be through the news channels. If I was overseas, you usually only got one, mm -hmm. and you had to go with it. it by that and so uh, reading was not I, um, I read so much worked so much with computers that the time I got home my eyes were fried and reading wasn't uh, a deal mm -hmm. what particular book would you say influenced your life the most and why uh, there was a book uh, by a gentleman by the name of John Wooden he uh, was a basketball coach of UCLA, played basketball a real long time ago at Purdue, and I read his book and some of his sayings like, be quick, don't hurry. Uh, 
I've always just kind of, uh, it's always just kind of been there with me. And I mean, when we're talking, I read that clear back in high school, and that was always been one stuck of with you. Uh, stuck with me. So, did you use libraries when you were in the service? Why were not? Yes, uh, a lot of military schools. Like I said, every time you got to a certain rank, you had to go to schools, and uh, a lot of the schools that I went to were college level classes you got credit for them mm -hmm. in college and a lot of research papers a lot of documentation um, and it was like if it's a six-week course you end up writing six papers you know at a certain length mm -hmm. so yeah uh, the library the libraries at the on most military bases are very very strong and stuff like that so um. What was the return home like from your deployments? Uh, the one from coming back from Desert Storm, it was fun, but I went back to uh, I went back to the to the Netherlands. I didn't come back to the United States. Uh, my family was still in the United States. They weren't with me in Korea or the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, it was it was okay. It was dang. Uh, the return home from Korea, coming back to see my family was really good. I never saw, you know, the parades and stuff like that, like the United States had on for for people. Mm -hmm. But the majority of those people were coming back either to a military base or coming back just to their civilian mm -hmm. life because they were National Guard or Reserve. And but it's always, I mean, no matter no matter where you are, uh, people don't seem to understand. <clears throat> Coming back to the United States is probably, it's a thrill. It's, you know, um, just the everyday convenience that we have, you don't have over there. You know, uh, there's a difference between our 110 and their 220, and there's a difference between uh, Netherlands. I didn't have screens in my window, uh, so... You could open your window, but if you wanted every bug in the United <laughs> States or in the, in the Netherlands, you know, uh, coming back, coming back to the United States is is fantastic, you know. So. Sure. How were you received by your family and community? Uh, coming back from the, to from Korea, it was it was fantastic. There was probably uh, my wife and uh, the two kids plus about. 15 people that either worked for me or met me at, met at the airport and so it was it was a good time um, when I got back to Netherlands after Desert Storm uh, all my co-workers were there and the base there was probably 200 people I knew my co-workers I didn't know enjoy the other ones but mm -hmm. you know getting off the plane is, is, a, is a good thing sure how did you readjust to civilian life I worked, so I, worked, I worked for the military for three years afterwards and lived in the community outside Scott Air Force Base. And um, it was okay then. But then, uh, due to cutbacks, my job went away uh, and I moved to Champaign Urbana. Mm -hmm. Adjusting to that and adjusting to there's a place and time for everything type mentality. Uh, when I went to, they appointed me on the awards committee at Provena, when it was, still was Provena. And um, a lady says, well, we should give an award out for people that come to work all the time. And I laughed. <laughs> and she says, what's so funny? I said, well, if you don't come to work in the military, you go to jail. And they never invited me back. And then... <laughs> So they put me on a disaster thing, and they said, come up with a disaster in this area that could cause problems. And I did. Told them I would be on a train. I blocked the two hospitals off, and I'd blow up the train, and they never asked me back again. Matter of fact, they asked my boss if I was all right. Because <laughs> oh. um, I, when I was in Korea, I worked with medical readiness, and our, our job was to create the worst situation, not the easiest situation, you know, right. and um, because over in Korea, even though it, well, it's still considered a conflict to this day, 
but you never knew every morning what, well, he, well he's doing crazy enough now, but it was like that, you know, back in 1990. You never knew what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of stuff that goes on over there that never hits the news because right. it, it, you get used to that craziness over there. So, True. But, yeah, it's, it is an adjustment, uh, adjustment for all of them. One of the biggest adjustments is, um, especially some of the younger veterans, is the they are... You know, you got up at this time, you got up at this time, you had a mission, so your goal was that mission. You come back, your kids are wanting to go to soccer, the other kids wanting to go to piano, whatever, and you're being pulled in all different all different ways. Mm -hmm. And like I said earlier, your spouse becomes more of a um, uh, disciplined person because she had to, or mm -hmm. he had to, one or two, and you kind of feel like you don't have a job anymore. And... And it's it's tough, you know. Uh, I deal with uh, some some folks now in my job, you know. And then you've got some people come back and they've got what they call Superman syndrome, where well, I survived the war. Let me go ride my motorcycle 130 miles an hour, mm -hmm. and that's just you know thing. But one of the toughest things for the people coming back is to take their military experience and put it in a resume. Mm -hmm. And that's probably one of the toughest things people have, because mm -hmm. there's no place on the civilian uh, thing that you shot at people, mm -hmm. uh, you know. And um, I remember applying for a job at Carl, and the lady says, "Have you ever fired anybody?" And my answer to her said, "I said no, but I've kicked them out of the military and ruined their lives." Mm -hmm. And I was just being joking and around about. I know I wasn't joking, but I was. And she didn't like that. She didn't like that answer one bit. But mm -hmm. there's a difference between firing somebody and kicking somebody out of the military. So, mm -hmm. so it's it's tough. It's a tough adjustment. You just got to mm -hmm. breathe, <laughs> I guess. And you know, and one thing good about this community, there is the VFWs. Uh, one of the greatest things is now they've started the Student Veterans. Association, uh, Jason, I can't pronounce his last name. Sikowski? Yeah, that's the guy. Mm -hmm. um, he does a fine, jo fine job with running that. And I know Parkland has one too. Mm -hmm. And it's, I didn't, it would have been nice to have a group right when I got out of veterans to talk to, you know. Mm -hmm. so. so when you, so you said you were uh, a tr contractor for three years. Yeah. And then your job was eliminated. How was that transition? from being the contractor to moving to Champaign and, and not and no longer being part of the that military was cold. life. That was cold. <laughs> it really was. I mean, there was no Facebook at the time. Uh, there was no talking to people. Uh, I went nine months without a job. I did have my military retirement, which it wasn't much, but mm -hmm. uh, it helped. Uh, they didn't have the office like I have now to go to and say, hey, is there anybody looking for jobs? Uh, even now, the unemployment office here in town has a veteran that job is to strictly help veterans. I spend a lot of nights on the computer searching the job. Uh, did know a soul in Champaign Urbana, and was basically asked why I'm taking a job that probably I did the fifth year in the military. Mm -hmm. And my answer was, I need money. And I took that job, and then by the time um, Pravina merged, my job went to Bolingbrook, but I was so entrenched in the this community, I didn't want to leave. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's when I um, the job I have now started up, and I had to basically be unemployed again for eight more months to wait for that job. And, Helping, helping veterans is, I'm glad I did, not move to Bowling, Bolingbrook. It was, it was a good decision. Mm -hmm. So you ended up in Champaign for the job that for you the job. had? For the job, yeah. Okay. Um, so you remained in contact with other veterans. You know, you said you were doing Facebook and writing letters and um, VFW. Are there other things that you do to stay in touch with other veterans? Uh, every now and then, the... Last group of kids uh, that I supervised, 
we meet down at Scott Air Force Base. My children still live down three miles from the Air Force Base. Uh, I get down there for any, about once every couple months I go down there and I still hook, uh, hook up with some people. Um, that's, that's about it staying there, you know, with the mm -hmm. folks I, I've stationed with. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. Um, so are you a member of any veterans organizations and if so, which? Yes, I am. I'm a member of the American Legion in my hometown in Indiana, and that's for my dad's benefit. But I am a member of the Veterans of Foreign Wars here in Urbana. Uh, like I said earlier, I am just got elected to junior vice for the whole state of Illinois. Mm -hmm. So in a couple of years, I'll be the state commander in that. And now basically, that just takes up two weekends a month out of my <laughs> already been, but you know, uh, being able to talk to lawmakers, being able to, uh, I had a guy come in my office today, uh, a friend of his lady, uh, a friend of his husband, a uh, friend of his, the wife of a veteran passed away and she wanted to give money to some type of memorial and um, it was for, she wanted to do it for dogs, mm -hmm. for PTSD and I knew uh, a past state commander VFW called him and said, where did you get your, her name, her name's Mama Cass. I said, where'd you get Mama's been all over the world, all over the United States at least. Mm -hmm. And he told me it was a place here in Illinois, <coughs> which I like to keep stuff locally, locally or mm -hmm. in this state, and it's a place out of uh, southern Illinois, and gave the lady the address, and, you know, it'll help veterans here in Illinois. Cool. Um, what else have you done since separating from the military? Basically, uh, I have... Uh, we either worked in this community or helped veterans. That's it. We got remarried. <laughs> so that's something. <laughs> As a veteran, have you used your local library? Why or why not? Uh, yes, I have. Uh, I used the one in Urbana, I'd say probably four times a year. Every now and then I go down there. A uh, gentleman by the name of Ray Elliott here in town he used to be a teacher in... Uh, Urbana, he's a uh, Marine Corps veteran, puts wild ideals in my head, and I go there and, <laughs> and you know, he talks about books. Well, he's an author, too. Uh, he wrote a good book on Iwo Jima. Um, but I usually go there in case I need to make speeches. I want to make sure I don't trust the Internet 100%, probably not even, yeah, about 50%. And... <laughs> Probably uh, smart. <laughs> and I want to, I, yeah, I want to make sure before I quote somebody or I, you know, say something that, because mm -hmm. one wrong word and it's everybody's going to hear about it. So it's better to, you know. <laughs> so. Generally, what has your experience been like when you use the library? Uh one the one in Urbana. Uh, I can find everything I need to find. It's not too bad. Uh, the one in Champaign, I bet I can say the only time I've been there is for meetings. I don't. Uh, we do go there. I do go there once a month to the one in Champaign, and it's to help out the homeless veterans because that's one place I know mm -hmm. here in this area that they're allowed in during the daytime. So mm -hmm. we go there to make sure they, you know, that we can get them to the VA for medical care and stuff like that. Sure. As a veteran, are there programs or types of books available at the library that you enjoy more than others? Uh, I'm still sports-minded. I would read uh, uh, autobiographies in the first place. Uh, I read a lot of about my fascination with I guess presidents. Uh, I actually went to college first to become a lawyer. You, one thing I can tell everybody, you don't go to the school because of your dad and they don't focus on that degree. Uh, it's kind of tough. Um, but that's the type of books. Actually, 
military books unless it, it's an, a, an, a, a, like a true event. Yeah, I'm mm -hmm. not into the fiction part of it, the sure. whole deal. Okay. How did your military experiences affect your life? Uh, like I told the newspaper, Paul Wood interviewed me probably a year ago. Uh, it's the best decision of my life. Uh, I earned respect. My little, well, it's bigger now, but my town was probably 12,000 people. With my dad being a coach, everybody knew who I was. Uh, I got respect back. I made my dad proud. And what I learned in the military, I'm still using today and helping, helping the veterans, so. Mm -hmm. What are some life lessons you learned from military service? Oh, boy. <laughs> Take your time. Is this on the on the <laughs> um, no, it's um, growing up with my dad being a teacher. Respect was always there. But it was yeah, that was instilled into me. I still call people, ma'am, sir, no matter what their age is. It it just you know you're it's ingrained in the military. Um, helping others is ingrained in the military. The um, Time and place, you know, being, I still, if you're, if meeting's at one and you're there at five till one, you're still like, you know, <laughs> uh, you, don't, you don't see that, you know. Uh, and I, I know a gentleman that we were talking about the other day, he said he'd rather miss a meeting than walk into a meeting late, and he's, mm -hmm. he was a military person. You just, you know, the, there's... Uh, being newly married, uh, my wife can tell you there's certain things I do that is out of habit. You know, as a, you know, I still fold my underwear the same way the military taught me <laughs> back in 1981. Drives her nuts, but hey, but there's there's just a lot of values. Um, the Air Force was service before self, and uh, and integrity of all you do, and that you know that it got ingrained in you. You know. 21 years of someone telling you that you finally believe him after a little bit of while. <laughs> How has the military service impacted your feelings about war and the military in general? Um, the easiest way to put it is if they would take a 57-year-old guy a little bit overweight, I'd go back and help those help the folks out. Um, the Or I would go to... Scott Air Force Base and do whatever. I can still unload trucks. I can still count pills and I can still do all that. They'll free somebody else up. I would still do it. Uh, I believe in what the military does and I will do. I would do anything to support them on that, on that thing. Mm -hmm. What message would you like to leave for future generations who will hear this interview? Um, I would tell them once they get out, they're going to go through a period of time where the, that's the farthest thing they want from the mil military. But um, they need to help their military brotherhood out when they get out. Uh, like when I was in, I was told I'd get free health care for life. Uh, now that free health care cost. Um, we need to stick together for the things that was promised. Uh, to to the veterans that slowly seem to go away because it's easier to to cut a small amount than to cut the whole United States. So mm -hmm. I would say that you know take your time, you know breathe a little bit because it, it is a change, and um, then help 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 the, your your brotherhood out because. Uh, we need to. We need all. We need all to stick together. That's the best thing I can tell them. Mm -hmm. And thank you for what they did. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you feel like we haven't discussed or should be added to this interview? And if so, what? No, I think we covered everything. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> well, that's all the questions we have. All right. um, so thank you very much for being interviewed. Um, and you need people, correct? <laughs>